I've always liked building my own gear. And as some of you know, I've built my own EQ. I've built my own audio encabulator, which by the way is actually a working thing. It's not, it's not a joke. And I've built an SSL bus compressor. However, one of the things that are pretty rare in the DIY community are microphones. And when Lewitt emailed me if I wanted to come over to build a microphone myself, I immediately said yes, because I wanted to figure out how difficult it actually was. So let's go to Vienna and let's get started. So apparently building your own microphone starts with 3D printing. Now I have a 3D printer, but not something like this. This looks completely different. And here to talk more about it is Gernot. This is Gernot. And maybe you can explain a little bit what you are doing over here with the 3D printers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these, these are SLA printers. They work with uh, resin. They give us uh, nice smooth models. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, quite important to start with a 3D print early, so you can have something to hold in your hand. Uh, you can find mistakes in the design. A whole range of advantages. I don't know if any of the viewers already recognize this, but this... Like, to me this looks like it's a molded part, it's not 3D printed. But you're sure this comes this out of a... This comes out of a 3D printer, yeah. This is... This one, to be precise. Oh, <laughs> this is really, really incredible. Yeah. This is, I think, from the LCT. 1040? From, yes, it's from the 1040. It's uh, from the prototyping stage where we already were trying uh, the tube inside, so it's made from a material that can resist the heat of the tube. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, because like, like the finished product is going to be metal. And because you're prototyping with plastic, you have to take into account all, all of those yes, things. Yes. Mm -hmm. So do you also do some things like coating or something for the oh, for the sheet, RF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so um, later, when you put it all together, it looks like this, and this has the, a different color, and the color is basically the, the coating. This really it looks is, like yeah. the real one, but it's like, I, I, you can't feel this, but this feels a lot lighter than the real 1040. But this really, so, sorry, it's, for me it's really incredible that this comes out of a 3D printer. Like, like if you see my 3D prints, it's not, it's not that, that good. You mm, made your 3D print is probably more like, like the other one, we yeah. have, which works with a filament. Yeah. This was made with uh, a filament printer. Yeah. So, so it all starts with you have an idea, you have a model, and you're 3D printing it to make sure that the model is actually what you think it will be, to test it out, to see how it will hold, where the buttons exactly. are. And that's easier to do than creating it out, all out of metal and that kind of stuff. Yes, yes. So the, at some point we make a metal prototype. But uh, before that, you want to test already many things and you want to get yeah. close to, to what you really yeah. uh, envision. But on, just on the computer, you don't have a feel for the size, you, don't, you can't test the ergonomics. You want to feel it, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, really nice. Even the buttons on here are 3D printed, it's super, super nice. So, I've been told that we are standing in this 3D printed room for a special reason, and I think you can tell me more about that. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I've recently made a, a print a custom part. <laughs> okay, a cus custom uh, part. A custom part. Looks like this. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So this is a part, and it has my logo in it. Mm -hmm. uh, from the 440 Pure, the part that holds the capsule. So it's part of this uh, the assembly that holds the capsule. Wow, that's really nice, wow. And this is going to be in the microphone that I'm going to be building. Oh yes, hopefully. <laughs> Let's hope that it works, yeah. because then it will be a one-off uh, one. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're really nice, yeah. really nice. So, I've switched rooms now. Uh, I've got my part. I've got a lot more parts. And I've got help from John. And I've already seen that I'm really going to need that, because there are a lot of parts and I think to start we should first walk through all the parts that are on here. Sure. 
So where do we start? We can start, I mean, we can start where it's all about. Basically, yeah. this is the capsule. This is the primary point at which we convert any sound waves into an electrical signal. Um, it's the most important part of the microphone. Without this, there's no, well, there is an output, but it's only going to be noise. So basically, um, this is essentially, you can think of it as a capacitor, but it's a very thin diaphragm that vibrates uh, when a sound wave arrives. And we capture that signal and pass it through the electronics. Yeah. This is the main PCB. Um, yeah. This has everything on board that we need to take the uh, the signal from the capsule and present it to the output uh, in here in this product. Yeah. With an XLR, so a balanced output signal as we know well, phantom yeah. power. That's why you need phantom power to power the PCB. Exactly. And to power the capsule. Exactly. So for this kind of microphone, which is a condenser microphone, a true condenser. The capsule itself requires a polarization voltage, and what that means is that we need to apply a, a DC voltage to uh, to the capsule, which means that it's, it's essentially biased. It puts into a state which we can then use to sense the vibrations in an ideal way. Yeah. Um, and that circuitry is everything is on board here, but essentially the circuitry is provided to present that voltage. We essentially set up the capsule to have the right level of output based on the voltage we apply. If we applied more voltage, we'd get more level from the capsule. Yeah. And if we applied less voltage, we'd have less level from the capsule. Okay. So quieter and louder. Um, the circuitry at the front end is very important because uh, we need to have the, the most uh, clean uh, interface with the capsule itself. The output of the capsule, you know, it's a very small, it looks large, relatively speaking, but the diaphragm itself is extremely thin. And the vibrations are also very, very, very small. Um, because of that, the signal that comes out of here is very fragile. We need to interface with it extremely carefully uh, with the correct electronics to have the right conditions on their, on their input side. And once the signal is through that point and the voltage is applied here, we then have a signal in a condition that is more suitable for working with in other ways. In this microphone, this is our LCT440 Pure. Here we just provide what the user needs on a pure level. So the signal passes through all of the circuitry and we condition it for the output. So we balance the signal and essentially ensure that things are noise free and well, well handled. But in other microphone types we make, we may also introduce other circuitry like high pass filter options. They yeah, may be achieved yeah. in different ways. They can be achieved by modifying the voltage, as I said before. Less yeah. voltage is quieter, more voltage is louder. Yeah. They may also be achieved with other approaches. And we may also, for other designs, want to change the polar pattern yeah. uh, or apply some filtering. So a high pass filter could be part of this following circuitry. More control features to change these voltages to basically change... Uh, the polar pattern of the microphone that's usually achieved by a microphone capsule that has two sides and they have yeah. different voltages applied. Yeah. In this particular example we're looking at, we don't have those features. So the signal arrives in the capsule, it passes through the circuitry, and after all of the conditioning, it arrives at the output in a balanced form that's then ready to present over an XLR cable to your microphone preamp of choice. Okay, nice. So um, then there we also have like the housing, of course, that is around it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's made out of metal. Exactly. And I think that's for a pretty good reason or multiple yeah. reasons. So here we have a lot of circuitry. Yeah. We have a capacitor, essentially, and a circuit. And we have our audio signal. We want it to be pure and unmodified or uninterfered with. We need to have the housing for a number of reasons. Um, those reasons are we want to electrically isolate everything. The capsule and the circuit form one part of the whole circuit together. And we need to put that into what we would call a Faraday cage, electrically speaking. And what that means is that if you leave these guys out in the open and connect them, then actually they would function. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of circuitry here that would pick up other signals. So we're talking electromagnetic waves, maybe even kind of radio signals. There'll be a lot of hum. Yeah. So depending on where you're from, 50 yeah. hertz, 60 hertz. Yeah. Um, and we don't want any of that interference in there. You may have experienced this in some microphones when maybe something gets damaged or something isn't connected properly or you have a bad XLR that suddenly this uh, shield, which is actually also important in other parts of the signal chain that follow, uh, that it's not compromised. Um, so we want to have a conductive metal shield around our entire system, yep. uh, which we basically put to ground. And what that means is that all of these interfering signals that come in are captured by the external electrical casing, the metal casing, and they are sent to a safe place, i.e. they're sent to ground. Uh, we don't pick them up inside the circuitry that's important yeah. for the signal. For that to work well, we need all elements to be conductive uh, and to be connected. And that's also why the bottom part of this doesn't have any paint on it, because otherwise it will... Pretty much. It won't conduct. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So it's important that everything is conducting as well. Yeah. And it's also, of course, like, and I think this is for the bottom part as well, your microphones are always at risk. That, that's the part of your signal chain that's the most at risk because they are in a room with other people 
Uh, they can trip over cables, that kind of stuff. So it's also, apart from electrically shielding it, it's also just to protect everything. Exactly. Yeah. So but it's not just protection. It's like a lot of thought goes in there. Exactly. This, of course, is not going to work as it is right now. Not so very well. No, no. No, not very well. No, no. I, I'm wondering what sound would come out if I would now plug it in, but I don't think uh, I want to hear that. So where do we start with the assembly? So I think first things first is that we can uh, mount the PCB onto the PCB frame. Yeah. Um, in order to do this, we'll need our, of course, the PCB. Yeah. Um, do we can, already need to wear gloves or? Uh, at this point, you should be. We should basically place some gloves on. So okay. One comment I have here when we start to handle the internal uh, components is that basically our hands are, you know, we have naturally have oil or moisture or anything else yeah. like that, and as I said, the signals here are very sensitive, so we want to avoid creating any 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 whatever we have in our yeah. hands uh, yeah. to interfere with that. I think it fit like this. Exactly. Or? And you're going to want to take this screw. Yes, yeah. we can start here. Um, and basically this guy wants to go directly here and you'll okay. need a uh, positive drive. Yeah. So it can help just to yeah, stabilize the enclosure. You can drop them in. Yeah, maybe you can do the first. Uh, just gently. Yeah. All right. The trick here is to not over tighten when you are yeah, just, just enough uh, that it's safe, but um, yeah. we don't yeah. want to apply any unnecessary pressure to the PCB. So. In there is in there. Like, in there yeah. is in there. So one of the requirements for the people building microphones is that they have a very steady hand, I think. Exactly. Great. And, then and now, um, as you like, you can basically take the structure in. Um, maybe you want to use the other ones so you yeah. have enough clearance. Yeah place the, the tweezers it towards the base, exactly, yeah. and then you could either turn the microphone around or you could turn this around, and just enough to get, yeah. I'm going to try the difficult uh, okay. <laughs> difficult one. Exactly, and then if you like, I can uh, just Yeah, if you can do a little bit of, uh, like yeah. So you can release the pressure. Yeah. All right, okay. super, yeah. So, this is kind of ensuring, uh, again, we have a, a conductive point. Yeah, so this, is, this is really the grounding uh, part. Yeah. One of many. Now that this is assembled, now we yeah. know that that's going to be ready. And we can okay. now take a look towards building the capsule support. So we have a few more screws here that we will come to, but yeah. they're not ready yet. We now have the capsule support. And the first thing we want to do here is, this is part of our, um, our damping mechanism. Yeah. Is, so it, is it like special material? Is it rubber or something? Or? Yeah, it's essentially rubber. And oh, all, okay. whenever we go through a product design process, we of course optimize all relevant parameters for each microphone type to yep. try to give the best experience yep. to the customer in terms of you know how things vibrate and the handling handling noise, which is kind of to say, if you bump into this microphone, how does that sound on the capsule? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of different layers of protection as well because exactly. like there's like the big clam with the yeah. elastics and stuff. And everything yeah. is basically tuned to be yeah. one optimal system when all parts are brought together. Yeah. In order to do this, basically you see that we have a, a sort of key mechanism. Yeah. And then this can basically be dropped in accordingly. Yeah. Into here. Like needs to this. be a tight, relatively tight fit, exactly. Like this, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, looks okay. Yeah. Um, now, one thing I'll mention is that we often apply some additional, um, some additional uh, sort of damping. It's not really a glue. It's not. It's somewhere like a rubber, but it's a material that we apply at the end. And um, we're not going to do it now on camera, just because it takes a long time to cure. Yeah. But it yeah. looks like this. That's the stuff. Yeah. That's the magic stuff. Here's one we made earlier. Yeah. Just to see yeah. how that might be placed around. Yeah. 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 And it's also on the back, right? Or yeah, we also have a little. You'll find it. It's 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 around. Yeah, say, yeah, 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 yeah. Just to shield everything. So okay. now we want to drop this guy, just to help us to keep everything in place. We can drop him in here, and align with the screw holes. Yeah. And then you have two screws that can be dropped in. Then like this. And the same again. You may want to stabilize the tweezers while you get your first uh, twist in there. Now you have the uh, the capsule support in place. Yeah. At this point, we can now drop in our actual capsule holder that sits yeah. on the capsule support. Um, it's locked in a nice way, so it's you know it can't really move into the wrong orientation. Yeah. This guy might take a little work. This guy, you'll need yeah, also this guy, and yeah. then you need to apply a little pressure as you as you um, yeah bring him down. It's a bit of a tight fit. Don't we need it to put this directly in? and drop him in there? Yeah. Drop it in here, like that, mm -hmm. and then slow and steady within some down pressure is good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's already good. It's going yeah. happening. Yeah. 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 yeah, and it should be able to move a little bit, right? Or yeah, it's a damping mechanism, yeah, yeah, so there yeah. must be. But basically, that's essentially what this final yeah. uh, material we put in is to yeah. kind of bring it to the right level of movement. So not okay. too much movement, not yeah. too little movement, just yeah. enough to provide nice. the damping that we want. The next section is going to basically be that we want to slide this onto yeah. the frame. Yeah. 
exactly. Needs to and if you go just in a little, yeah. you might yeah. want to go the other way. Thumbs from depending on how easy oh, this yeah, course, yeah. it might be a little easier to thumbs together and just ease. Yeah, slow and yeah. steady. Great. I think so it's, it looks uh, like you're in. Yeah, it uh, it doesn't go any further. So that's uh, doesn't go any further. Yeah, it's one good looking custom. Uh, custom. custom support, yeah, right? really really nice. I think the the most sensible thing to do now would be to. Basically, we can place the capsule on, at least fix it in with the screws, because yeah. then we know that things are placed, and then we will be able to bring in the actual head basket yeah. to protect okay. it before we do any soldering. So what what we might want to do here is to take, depending on orientation, maybe yeah. you could take the capsule with your with your left hand if you like. Uh, I think left hand is best, yeah. If you take it, it's going to go on this way, so it's good to, to pick it up from the side. Yeah. Careful to not place fingers anywhere near the diaphragm. Yeah. It's very delicate. Yeah, you can only touch the side of the capsule. Only yeah. touch the side. And the... Um, and the cable is, is more or less going in the right direction right now. Yeah. So I have to place it like this. It might help to, I can tilt this up for you slightly. Yeah. You might want to be able to see what's going on. Yeah. So you want to basically mate, you want to introduce this screw into this hole. Maybe yeah. we could start, it might be a little easier to start with a screw already in the hole. Because it oh may, yeah, and then I can see it where- It uh, just aid you to- Yeah. I'm really surprised by how heavy that uh, switch capsule is like. Yeah. I was expecting it to be super light, but- So now at least things are more or less in the right place. Yeah. Okay. And you'll no. need to, if you steady it with the screwdriver, yeah. then you have control of the of the screw, and then you just need to basically align the screw with the hole. Yeah, got it. And once you're in a couple of turns, then it's yeah. relatively safe. Yeah. Here you can tighten quite a bit. This. Yeah, I want it to be safe. <laughs> exactly. So just just not all the way, but almost Reasonably, all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like because you can tighten again at the end, because now yeah. we have to do the same on this side. Yeah. And do we need the grounding wire exactly. in there as well? Yeah. And the grounding wire is already more or less underneath, so I just pull it out for you slightly. Yeah. And you need to now take the other screw in the same way through yeah. the grounding wire, through the uh, the plastic support. So okay, if I rest it on the side of the capsule, this is okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to need to. Oh dear. Again, this might be more helpful than the. Um, yeah, yeah, the small one. Yeah. Yeah, but at least the cap the capsule is now secured. So. Uh, let me see. I think like this. Exactly. It's delicate yeah. working. Okay. Yeah. And the holes are on both sides? Or? The yeah. holes on both sides. Okay. And now you're in a stable situation where it can yeah. be nice to grip the microphone from its from its body like this, yeah. and you can just tighten the side, yeah. turn, tighten on the yeah. other side. So this is just hand tight is enough? or Hand really... tight will be enough, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because we also don't want to put any undue force on the, the cable. Yeah. So now the best thing we can do is protect our capsule. So we uh, yeah, probably... let's, let's do that. Yeah, that's... Uh... We should look towards the um, putting the head basket together, okay. because when we solder, We'd like to have the capsule protected so we don't spit any solder accidentally onto the membrane. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to mount the inner mesh, ease it sideways onto the frame. So just like this. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I don't want to break this. No, you should be able to just ease it through. Okay. But if you try to keep the pressure regular so we don't put it out of shape. So now you can see that this is in place and yeah. these holes align. So what we now want to do is that we have these very small screws. <laughs> these are very small. This it gets smaller and smaller. It gets smaller and smaller. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, these are. These are very small. And really small. Here, basically, we have the small screws. The screws are going through from the bottom, and they're going to meet these nuts, which need to be sat on the top. So to do this, you may need to use a combination of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've seen... Yeah, yeah. The last section is basically we do this so that we have a protective yeah. grill. It needs to go on anyway, but... The main reason I want to do it is so that we can actually mount this directly over the capsule yeah. because then we can solder with yeah. uh, peace of mind. So yeah. So we now need to join these two together. Exactly. And actually that it should just slot straight on. So now basically, now I've things securely inside, yeah. we are in a much safer position from um, getting solder into the into the capsule. If you want to be very careful, we could cover it further, but I think it should be sufficient at this point in time. Yeah. And the last section will basically be about soldering these cables on. I would apply a small blob of solder to the iron first, yeah. so it's loaded, as it yeah. were. Uh, not active. too much, yeah. um, just a small amount, so you know you have something to work with. Yeah. Heat up both if you apply, if you have a blob locally. Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay, I think you're there. Cool. Yep, yeah. and the same again for the other guy. Yeah. Okay, I think it's it's reasonable. It's, yeah. Let's see, we'll see if we have this just a little bit of loose solder now, just remove. Oh, okay. Just so we don't have anything short circuit. Wow. And then we can bring our little... Yeah. So the way it's soldered can really change the measurement? It's just that you might not see it in the sensitivity, but it's possible that you might see, uh, see it in the noise performance. And the reason for that is that 
again, as we said, this is the out the output, the signal that's coming from this is very fragile. Yeah. We want to interface with it in the best way we can. We try to ensure everything we can in terms of the cleanliness of the solder and the quality of the contacts. And even sometimes we actually apply a protective layer after this point um, yeah. in production. And the point being is that everything is as stable as possible and yeah. all of these small elements together these design aspects that we take care with allow us to have um you know really high level or quiet but high technical performance level of noise yeah yeah because uh, if you don't solder it good enough there will be a little bit of resistance on there exactly. yeah, that's yeah. like yeah and the signals are so small that every yeah. little bit actually yeah it affects it quite a lot all right, right. and now and if all is good we should be able to make the two parts so yeah. the capsule should point in the same direction as the logo on this product like or you can align the XLR. This hole should align with this hole. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, like this. Yeah, this is the front. Everything yeah. should just slot in like a glove. Yeah. Yep. Well, my gloves don't make a clicky noise. Mine so. do. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one, largest, the largest screw goes in to lock the XLR connector. Okay. So with it goes into one? the barrel here. Yeah. So we first get, we first do this. Yeah. Exactly. And now you need the uh, the hex. You need the hexer. Yeah. And this is another point of electrical contact, of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this feels really satisfying now that it's like a full... It really looks like it's done now. Mm. But we don't know that yet, of course. <laughs> we will find out. Yeah, we will find out. So, I've just made this. But we don't know yet if it works. And you know how to find out. Exactly. So, we're in the lab right now. It's uh, some kind of an anechoic chamber. And we've got a whole measurement set up here. And this is actually a microphone that I just built. We're going to find out if it actually works. Or we, well know, it it, works. we know it works, but yeah. we don't know if it works well enough. So how are we going to do that? OK, so within this test area that we have, uh, basically we have a kind of semi anechoic condition, you could say. We have some absorption in the walls. Um, and we basically uh, will present a logarithmic sign sweep uh, from our loudspeaker. Yeah. through our acoustic system, which is calibrated, so we know exactly, we've already defined how the sound pressure is at this exact point in space Yeah. with our reference setup, which we do on basically a daily basis. And then we use what's called the substitution method. So we know how the sound is at this point, and then we put our test microphone at the exact point in space, which is why I'm using this laser to ensure yeah. that everything is completely yeah. where it should be. Yeah. Um, and then basically we use a logarithmic sine sweep, um, and we essentially, with this, we evaluate every frequency that we're interested in between the lower limit of hearing and the upper limit of hearing at a defined level at the test position and then we can look at okay how does the microphone behave for every frequency we test at so yeah. what is the frequency response right? um, and we have everything mounted on a turntable so first we can see does the frequency response at the front look correct that's the most yeah. important direction um, do we have everything we expect is the sensitivity at the correct level yeah and then um, and then we actually get to rotate every 10 degrees in this setup today, yeah. um, a full 360. So we can evaluate every 10 degrees, how does the response look? And we can see, okay, how does the pattern look? So if, for example, you were developing something, you had some problems, um, you might see that things are not held as they should be, but we will verify that we have a cardioid in this case, and that it looks good across frequency and the sensitivity is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and this is all going to happen it's automatically. Just, yeah, so it's, it's just pretty much a script that's yeah, yeah. running or something. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Great. Let's do that. All right. So we've measured it, and John, tell me, is it okay? It's okay. In fact, it measures great. It's. Uh, you can see the sensitivity is pretty much on spec, and um, also the pattern. We measured every angle in ten degrees around the whole way, and we can evaluate it and see that it's measuring just like it should do. It's a nice, fairly warm cardioid, and. Um, yeah, no issues. Looks like a clean microphone. Awesome. I just built myself a microphone. Cool. I don't recommend it to do, by the way, but yeah. Anyway. All right, so that's it. That's how you build a microphone or this microphone, because I'm actually talking through the microphone that I've built myself and of which I'm kind of proud of for me the conclusion would be yes if you have all the parts you can build your own microphone but don't do it and most certainly don't go out and disassemble your own Lewitt or whatever brand microphone and try to reassemble it again i know that some people out there want to do that don't do it it will definitely void your warranty and there's a big chance that you will irreversibly damage your microphone so keep your microphone together don't open it up like 
don't do it. So huge thanks to Lewitt for their hospitality and also a huge thanks to their whole team for helping me out while I was there. We've also recorded a podcast which will be on the Lewitt YouTube channel and we visited a nuclear power plant to <laughs> record a snare drum and that video will be on Instagram. Now, for the disclosure, which I always like to do, uh, Lewitt did invite me over and paid for my trip, but they didn't pay anything extra to me, like a fee or something. I still have a feeling that I could be pretty independent in this video. Also, Lewitt did take a look at this video before I published it, just to make sure that there weren't any trade secrets in the background or whatever. In the end, I was visiting them and I think it's fair enough to do that. Now, if you like my independence and want to support it, then make sure to do that by, for instance, buying something through my affiliate links. You can buy something at Toman using this QR code or ytcstudio.com slash Toman, or you can go to Sweetwater using this QR code or using ytcstudio.com slash Sweetwater. Another way to support me is by pledging a bit to my Patreon campaign, which I'll link over here. But of course, whitestudio.com slash Patreon uh, will also bring you there. YouTube memberships is also an option. There's a join button underneath this video somewhere. And the last way to support me and the whole YouTube platform is by watching more videos. So I'll link one of my videos over here. But you can also watch videos from different creators. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep pushing. And bye bye.